Ashley Bridwell is also a licensed social worker in the cancer space, and she's a, the program coordinator for adult neuro programs, licensed cancer social worker at Barrels Neurological Institute. I'll let her tell you a little more about her, but I just want to quickly say um, at the rehab program, as the rehab program coordinator for BNI, Ashley is the co-founder of the nation's first program to address traumatic brain injury in the domestic violence population. She has dedicated her career as a social worker to address and bring awareness to traumatic brain injury in vulnerable populations through community and through direct clinical care. Ashley, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to see you guys again, or I guess Della and you again. And you too. And thank you so much for putting in putting on these such informative webinars. I mean, I really like I, some of the information I've heard this morning is just it's gold, you know. And uh, lived experience, shared experience is is crucial for for people going through this. So thank you to everybody that's spoken before me. Um, like a couple of people said, I'm gonna kind of be a little redundant as far as some of the information, but um, just quickly, I want to tell you a little bit about my favorite person, moi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've been a social worker in neuro rehab at Barrow for 19 years. Um, I'll have 20 years in June of 2024, but who's counting, right? Um, I think COVID like made it like 10 years. So it's really actually going to be 30 in June. <laughs> Um, so I'm also a certified police officer instructor amongst other um, board memberships and that sort of thing. But I feel very passionately about uh, social justice when it comes to vulnerable populations. And um, so this is also me. Um, so this is where I started uh, my passion for helping others with brain tumor disease. Um, I was diagnosed with this uh, mass on March 3rd of 1999. Um, I was a sophomore at ASU. Um, I was having just kind of a variety of symptoms. You know, I had a twitch under my left eye, I had a tremor in my left hand. I had some discoordination. I had, um, I was dropping drinks. I was a, a waitress at Denny's. And, uh, so a long story short, eventually, you know, I got to a doctor that said, well, maybe you ought to have an MRI. And, uh, here we, here it is. <laughs> and so I was admitted that night and I had the first of four neurosurgical interventions the next day. Um, and, uh, so I, I like to, um, also share my, my punk rock moments of having a mohawk there with my, uh, my staples, uh, healing. And so, you know, I was very fortunate. I did have a grade one juvenile polycytic gastrocytoma. So with, uh, resection, it, um, it, um, through the grace of God, you know, I've, I've had no regrowth, no reoccurrence for 24 years. Um, so as a result of the surgeries, I did end up um, having uh, upper extremity uh, spasticity that's called dystonia. Um, so it's kind of like that, you know, your, your muscles, the muscles are firing all the time. So you're always trying to show somebody that your guns, right. It feels like you're flexing your muscles all the time. Um, it's really uncomfortable. And I also have that full visual field cut to the left. So I'll never drive again. Um, it's called the homonymous hemianopsia. And so between my experience, my lived experience, plus the 20-ish years I've been working with the neuro rehab population as a professional caregiver, I feel like sometimes that inside-outside perspective is, is, uh, is, a, is a unique perspective to be able to bring. And I'm grateful to be able to bring a little of it today. Um, so this is my support team. Uh, for all those wonderful caregivers uh, on 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 the Zoom meeting here, that's my mama and uh, my baby brother. And uh, so you'll see the 1999 photo is on the right, and I think that the on the left is a photo from a few, handful of years ago. But look how how handsome that little boy got. Um, so and you can see my little 1999 pager, right? You see the little pager clip to my. <laughs> <laughs> the times they are a changing, right? Um, but, you know, and, and this is why you guys are so crucial to the people that you are caring for and loving for through this, this awful, awful thing that happens to not just the person, but the whole family system um, is that, you, you know, you guys are like the key to this, I feel like as far as caregivers. And I tell patients all the time 
the difference between a mediocre recovery from a brain injury in particular and a phenomenal recovery is the quality of the family support they have. And so thank you for being educated and knowledgeable about caregiver stuff and, and paying attention to informational webinars and because this is how you get through this. Um, I think somebody asked before, you know, how do I deal with the anticipatory grief? Just like this. It's talking to people, it's networking, it's building small groups, it's doing whatever it takes to let you feel your feelings. Because I also heard somebody talk about Brene Brown and yes, mwah, I love her, great, best social worker. Um, but she always says feelings are for feeling. And my favorite term is also this too shall pass, right? The good stuff and the bad stuff. Um, so this is uh, just a fun fact. This is how I see, this is my visual field kit. Um, so it, it makes navigating through crowds a little tricky, but um, you know, we do it. I, I wanted to put this in here just to kind of give you guys a flavor of, although we may be talking about GBMs and, and um, prognosis and that sort of thing, as far as neuro rehabilitation and the role for neuro rehabilitation, it really can be helpful with any um, type or prognosis of tumor from the meningioma that, you know, I've heard the neurosurgeons joke, it's kind of like a hemorrhoid. You just pop that sucker right out of the brain. I know <laughs> it's this morbid, you know, medical humor, right? Um, to GBM where we know it's, it's um, you know, it's a nasty one and the DIPGs and that sort of thing. So, um, so neural rehabilitation can be about maintaining strength and endurance so that the the patient can continue to help care for themselves for as long as possible um, because you're right, independence does make them feel better um, and feel like they're taking a burden off of caregiver. So this is an example of uh, my own left upper extremity after 24 years of dealing with spasticity on a new machine that we've been using at, at Barrow. So on the left side, or sorry, on the right side is where I started. So you can see that that oval, right? It's supposed to be a circle. And uh, the, you can see the lines on the left side are a lot neater, right? And that was just from about five sessions of neuro rehab. So we do recover, right? So that neuroplasticity and the repetition of movements and the re neuromuscular re-education of neuro rehab is fascinating. The brain is, is just such an amazing organ. So, um, so this is just an example. Oh, Delane, yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, sorry to interrupt you. No, I it's okay. Forgot. So as a caregiver, I want you to talk about how important this information is because many of us here today have been or are a caregiver for a person who has had a traumatic brain injury, a resection. Mm -hmm. And many times when a patient, you know, gets out of surgery, mm -hmm. things are traumatic, you know, there's been a traumatic brain injury and that person may not be able to do mm -hmm. whatever it is that they could do. And I know that's a really scary thing, mm -hmm. not only for the patient, mm -hmm. but also it's incredibly scary as a caregiver. And to be honest, I wish someone had actually in my, for me, talk to me a little more about what to expect after surgery and the fact that there is neuro rehab that's going to happen mm -hmm. and that we may expect this, we may expect this. And literally looking at examples would have been super comforting mm -hmm. as, a, as a caregiver. I, I, I hear you to my core, Delan, and I'll tell you why. Um, I had this upper extremity spasticity and visual field cut from the day I left the hospital. Mm. I didn't get therapy for it until I started neuro, until I started working at Barrow. And somebody <laughs> said, have, do you have a split for that hand? And I was like, a what? You know? And so I agree. And this is sometimes what, and I'll tell you why I think it happens is that patients that come in for planned neurosurgical interventions um, that, you know, have a few days in the acute hospital, um, they don't. Uh, often do a lot of neuro evaluations um, because the focus is, is the, is this incision healing nicely? Did the surgery go well? Is your pain controlled? Right. So it's kind of like the nuts and bolts of, can we get you home safely? Right. Because we're negotiating with insurance contra contracts about right. how many days we can keep somebody. But anytime anybody has any surgery, I would suggest you can always ask for 
um, a neuro rehab evaluation <laughs> and talk with the hospitalist about getting that process started before you leave the hospital. And I wish somebody had done that for me too, Delan, because I went back to my life trying to figure out how to negotiate, you know, a full visual field cut on my own. Hmm. And fortunately, you know, at 19, I was a pistol. Well, I'm still kind of a pistol, but um, I was, you know, I just, I was just going to figure it out, you know, and, and I was ambulatory. I could walk. So and my mom and I got the bus book out and figured out how to get from point A to point B. And so, but <laughs> you're absolutely right because I could walk because both of my arms moved and because I had a safe discharge plan, I went home without neuro rehab. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I didn't get it until well after, you know, I mean, I had already been through two degrees and was working in a neuro rehab facility and didn't really know what it meant. <laughs> wow. So it's a very common experience. And we're trying to do more specifically at Barrow to designate people that have those planned neurosurgical interventions with like a navigator that can help kind of, um, sort of shepherd them through the process from planned neurosurgery to home, to home health, to outpatient rehab. So we're making an effort, but I agree it is a real problem. Um, so while we're talking about brain injury, because I, I think it's great that you introduce, introduce that term. Um, so there's traumatic brain injury and then there's acquired brain injury, right? And so um, the damage that's done to brain tissue as a result of inter neurosurgical intervention is considered a brain injury. I would consider it an acquired brain injury because it wasn't a jolt or hit to the head, which is what a traumatic injury is, just, just for the lingity sake. So we're talking about acquired brain injuries. And so when you have an injury to your brain, any injury, whether it's um, traumatic or uh, acquired, it largely affects people in three categories, physical, cognitive, and emotional, psychosocial. So, um, so this is where we introduce kind of the concept of neural rehab. So the physical deficits as a result of neurosurgical intervention can range from on the physical side, the opposite side of the body is affected, right? So my tumor was on the right. So the left side of my body is impacted um, from vision disturbances to dizziness to difficulties with debility, right? This happens to a lot of people as they're in the hospital for a real long time. And, you know, for every day you're in the hospital, it takes you about five days to recover. So the debility or lack of strength and endurance is something that neuro rehab can address as well. Um, so any, any differences be before and after neurosurgery, um, neuro rehab has a role in that. And it makes caregivers' lives a lot easier because here's the other thing is that you don't have to be the bad cop is when we were talking about things like the ramps and like, you know, wanting to go back to driving and work and, you know, rock climbing or whatever somebody wanted to do before surgery. When you're in a neuro rehab program, the therapists get to be the bad cops, right? So that takes the role of enforcing the rules away from the spouse, the mom, the sibling, whoever's doing the caregiving, right? Because, you know, good cop, bad cop, you got to have two different people for that versus just having it all in one uh, caregiver. Cause it's a lot of pressure on you guys, right? You got to do the, the house management, the bills, the appointments, the insurance, the, I mean, I've seen people come in with these just reams and reams of paper and just sit it down on my desk and just say, Oh my God, this is a full-time job. absolutely, freaking lutely Like it is. Yeah. You guys are, I, I tell my caregivers all the time that I want to give them an honorary social work degree. Um, because at the end of somebody's brain tumor disease or, or midst of it, you guys like know everything about social security and where to get ramps and where to get shower chairs and where, you know, you're giving other people advice in the lobby. I freaking love that when I hear one person talking to another person in the lobby and they're like, oh, have you tried blah, blah, blah? You know, <laughs> this is great. Um, so the role of outpatient rehab is to uh, look at limitations since surgery. So, or since onset of tumor. So physical therapy, addresses everything from the waist and down, including strength and endurance, and can address dizziness and inner ear vestibular issues. Um, occupational therapy, we think about it from everything from the waist and up, so upper extremity issues, as well as vision-related issues. Um, the convergence and divergence of, of vision can change a lot as a result of a neurosurgical intervention. And then lastly, the speech therapy component, which is a lot more than can you pronounce your R's and your L's. Speech therapy is at Barrow what we consider to be the cognitive retraining component. So we look at memory, attention, concentration, speed of processing, 
planning, organization. Um, so all of those cognitive functions um, we can evaluate if if somebody is noticing that those things have changed since the surgery. Um, so there's kind of two camps when you participate in neural rehab. So neuromuscular re-education is literally re-educating the muscles through repetition, repetition, repetition um, that actually rewires the brain, right? So that repetition creates circuitry in the brain that then holds on to that message. So sometimes we focus on neuro re-education first and see how much we can get back. And then towards, you know, as things kind of continue and we see that maybe that arm isn't going to get as much function as we thought, then we start working on compensatory strategies or what we call workarounds, right? So instead of having caregiver do all the peri care, like wipe somebody's bottom every single time because their dominant arm is affected, maybe we get a bidet on all of our toities at home, right? And so at least caregiver knows that if, if their loved one goes to the restroom at home, they're off duty. They can, you know, they got the bidet there. They can get everything all situated. Um, and these are just real life examples that have, you know, just come up constantly, right? So, um, and I think again, in the short and long-term diagnoses or prognosis, neural rehab has a role. Neural rehab on a short, short-term prognosis is about helping the patient maintain their strength and their endurance so that they can have a good quality of life for as much as, as they can, plus making sure that we have the right equipment at home so caregiver is safe, so you're not busting your back over doing unsafe transfers. You have the, you know, the, the hard and fast things in your home. Um, that question about ramps kind of cracked me up because I thought, you know, I, 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 that's, that's something that happens when, when two people are trying to agree on something that they've never had to deal with before. And um, I don't know what the right answer is. I guess it's maybe let them build as many ramps as they, <laughs> as they want, because you got to pick your battles, right? So and I'm trying to move through this, this information very quickly. I'm so sorry, you guys. So traditional outpatient um, is the PTOT speech. At Barrow, we have a partial day treatment program for people with neurological injury called the Bridge Program, which includes PTOT speech, psychology, and a smattering of groups. We have the Center for Transitional Neural Rehabilitation, which is a full comprehensive neural rehabilitation program. So five days a week, eight hours a day with an emphasis on return to work. We have movement disorder outpatient rehab for those that have Parkinsonian and spasticity that's related to uh, brain injury like mine. Um, and we have so many others, which just we, Barrow is really such a wonderful family. Um, so special considerations for caregivers, and I just have a couple more slides left and then we'll wrap up. Um, but so I was with a, a friend this past weekend whose daughter, unfortunately, is, is um, in stage four breast cancer. And he's my age. And so the two, which is, in, we're in our 40s. And um, we went and got him a tattoo of an oxygen mask on his wrist. Because when you get on the plane, what do they say, right? Put your oxygen mask on first and then help the person next to you. Because if you're not breathing, that person next to you isn't either, right? So we got a little tattoo of his, I didn't get one. Don't worry, don't tell mom. Um, <laughs> of the oxygen mask on his wrist so that he would constantly be reminded that he needs to really do self-care. So whatever it takes, you guys, I'm not suggesting tattoos. Don't all run out and get tattoos unless you think it'll be helpful to remind yourself that, you know, you have to take care of you. Um, as far as, so mood, make sure you're self-monitoring mood. Depression, very common, obviously, during this stage of caregiving and and just being kind of down the rabbit hole, as somebody I think described it. Um, list of activities that a family can pick to help you with. Absolutely. Write up a list. Somebody says, hey, what can I do to help? Email them the list, fax them the list, screenshot the list and say, pick any one of these and then leave it. Can I say something? Yes. The list. Um, also, truthfully, have it at your front door. Because yeah. Because sometimes people want to help. And they either come and visit or they come and they drop off a meal and literally having your list of, hey, I need help with what can you do? Here's the list. You know, it it just people will step up. People will step up right. because you're telling them exactly what you need. And in fact, I, I'd further that by saying there are people, especially, you know, in my life that have been so honored to help me. 
right? Because that's, that's such a, and it's a way to really deepen a friendship too. Mm -hmm. And it seems kind of weird that kind of counterintuitive that asking for somebody to do something for you would deepen your friendship, but it really does, right? Because you're, you're showing that vulnerability, right? You're, you're, you're getting a little bit vulnerable with somebody and saying, like, I really need some support with this. People, they feel closer to you. I really, I, I've, every time I have helped somebody or encouraged somebody to request help, it's really phenomenal what happens because they get so much more out of it than just what, whatever the task is. Right. And, um, so I, I, I always think about, you know, people say, I don't want to ask for help. Well, you know what, maybe it's not for you. Maybe that person on the other end that you're asking for help, maybe they really needed to feel useful and productive. You never know where people are at in their lives. I mean, I'm not trying to get like dramatic or whatever, but I think there's always a chance that the person on the receiving end is looking for exactly what, what you need. Um, so yeah, don't be, in fact, in, I like ask for help, like ask for go big or go home, you know, like yard work. Like, <laughs> um, so you will be amazed what people are willing to do when you get vulnerable with them. Um, and so list of activities. Yep. Oh, that's the other thing is with your loved one, if there are changes following surgery, and their friends want to come by, but it's like they feel awkward because they don't know what to do with that person to do with that person while they're there. And so what we've done with people before is made a list of activities that if a friend comes over or a family member comes over, safe activities that the family, that the loved one can do without supervision of their, of their caregiver, right? And so maybe it's like Scrabble or it's a walk down to the dog park or it's, um, you know, watching one of their favorite shows together and talking about it afterwards. Shoot, just going to a coffee shop, right? And just hanging out and just um, kibitzing, right? Um, so having a list of things that somebody can do with your loved one that's safe for them to do is crucial too. And it actually encourages people to visit because they don't have to figure it out, right? And so there's no awkwardness and there's no like, can he do this? And you're talking about him in front of him and that's weird. And so, um, and then counseling, counseling, counseling. I'm a, I'm a believer, you guys. I'm a freaking believer of counseling. It saved my life through recovering from brain tumor disease to integrating disability into my personhood, into a lot of the really emotionally um, traumatic things that, that, that comes out of, you know, this hospital trauma, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just quickly, a couple more ambiguous loss. I think it's important to have a word for what it, what you're experiencing when your family member comes home and they're not your family member anymore, right? Like that isn't my husband. Like their personality is completely different. Maybe they were like larger than life before and now they're super stoic and flat affect and they don't laugh or smile. Um, you know, we call it ambiguous loss and it's the stranger in the living room, right? Like, who is that guy? Like I brought him home from the hospital. I know they said, it, I know they said he was mine, but he doesn't, he doesn't really seem like, you know, my guy. Right. And that's, that's, that's grief. Right. And so you guys are negotiating that ambiguous loss while that person is still living. And so you've got the ambiguous loss. And then at some point, right, we all have the actual closure grief, which is, you know, the, the end part. Um, but I think this is really important for somebody to have a name to call this. So we call it ambiguous loss and it's, it's a caregiver, it's a caregiver thing for sure. Um, we talked about good cop, bad cop with rehab. Um, so your role when they're in rehab is be their cheerleader, let them fail. This is hard for caregivers and family members because nobody wants to see their person that they love so much struggle, right? But sometimes they have to, to be aware of what their limitations are, right? So kind of like, you know, you know Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Like if you go to AA meeting and you don't think you're an alcoholic, you're not going to get anything out of it. So if you're going to rehab and you don't have a lot of awareness of what's different since before your injury, you're going to kind of shine them on and go through the motions and do your thing. Um, but letting somebody fail at something every once in a while is, if it's for safety, is okay. Um, monitoring their progress because they won't be able to see it. Um, being their appointment keeper, their advocate. Um, so here are some caregiver resources the National Brain Tumor Association or the network. Great talk this morning, by the way, Alex, well done. Um, everybody has been so articulate. Um, Brain Injury Alliance or Association in your state is another resource that we don't frequently think about because we don't think about it as a um, brain injury, right? It's a brain tumor. You have brain tumor surgery. Well, 
we just all learned that acquired brain injury is what you're dealing with when you're dealing with the aftermath. So feel free to call the Brain Injury Alliance or Association in your state. Every, every state has one and get hooked up with a, a group or whatever. They tend to have a ton of services. 988, thank you, Alex. Yes, uh, the nationwide um, crisis hotline. So um, I'm on the board currently for the the Arizona statewide or Arizona statewide 988. And what's great about um, the hotline is that there's also a warm line component. And Alex, I don't know if you uh, went over this part of it, but yes, it's a hotline. So if there's a mental health emergency, like your loved one is having what we call a catastrophic response, which is they're presented with something that maybe was super easy for them prior. And now it's really hard. And that can be a very like disturbing emotional moment or anything else, right? With that emotional lability and just mood swings. So instead of calling 911 because your family member is out of control, you call 988 and it's way better to get a team of counselors than a team of cops. Um, so 988, if they feel like it's um, a situation where the person could be a danger to themselves or others, they'll actually send a crisis mobile team to your home to work with your family to determine what the best plan is for making sure that that person is psychologically and psychiatrically safe. Um, so I've done some ride-alongs with the crisis mobile teams. Wow, they are super good. Um, it, at least in Arizona, they're surgical. They kind of come in and they deal with the situation. And before you know it, they're out and you've got a good plan in front of you. So the other really great thing about 988 is that they have a warm line, which is when somebody just needs to talk to somebody, you can call 988 and ask for the warm line. You get a peer counselor, somebody that's had a mental health or a substance abuse issue on the other end of the phone that can just talk to you for 13 minutes. And then you hang up and you get 13 more minutes. And then you hang up and you get 13 more minutes. So hot or warm line, great resource for mental health resources as well. They will help you uh, learn and understand how to access your specific mental health services through your specific insurance. Because sometimes navigating through that can even be tricky. Um, so I went, oh, like 10 minutes over. I'm sorry, Delanne. You're fine. We um, were 10 minutes late getting you back on. So no okay. worries. No worries. I'm, um, trying, I'm just trying is, to honor everybody's time here. So thank you is, for letting me is, ramble on. Oh, this is great. I, I have a question um, for you when you're done. Are you done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. Okay, so this is really great. Your graphic is awesome. So I love the QR code. So it's yes. brain tumor patient and caregiver education. You guys will send this out too, but it's right there. If you want to scan it, it's awesome. Um, my question, I'm going to start with you. Um, but Ashley, because the question com has come up many times when people get a hold of us and also people, a lot of people who are joining us today is what types of respite care is available to caregivers? Yeah, that's, how, that's how a, do we find that out? That's a great question. And um, so um, when people ask me that, I usually ask them, are you looking for a private pay referral? Or are you looking for some, some kind of assistance through your health insurance? Um, so usually they say, oh, I, I'd really like my insurance to pay for it. And I agree. I, I think that would be wonderful. Um, however, when you call your health insurance to ask if you have caregiver benefits, be sure you use the right language, which is you're looking for a paid care attendant versus calling up and asking for home health, because those are two completely different things. So home health is skilled physical occupation or speech therapy at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pay, a paid care attendant is somebody that is a non-skilled, um, non not non-skilled, but non-licensed um, care attendant that provides non-skilled care. So they can't do meds, they can't do therapy. They're just kind of there to hang out, companion care, right? So call insurance first. Hey, does my insurance cover any paid care attendant services? The answer likely will be no. So then you have two options. You either figure out from a private pay perspective how you're going to raise enough money to take care of your family member, or in the state that you live in, you're going to connect with the Brain Injury Alliance or Association or the Brain Tumor Network um, to identify specific uh, respite resources in your community. But this question usually is about who's going to pay for this, mm -hmm. and your health insurance likely will not. Um, there are uh, home and community-based waiver programs in some states, 
which means that the states have figured out that keeping somebody in a nursing home is more expensive than keeping them at home with a, a paid care member or a paid care attendant. Mm -hmm. um, and they have something where they can uh, pay a caregiver to help you in your home instead of having that person be institutionalized. So in Arizona, we call it Arizona Long-Term Care Services, and there's very specific eligibility criteria. Yes, right. Um, I know, Carol, you have looked into that a little bit, not for your personal situation, but for others as well. Uh, my experience with uh, my late husband was that when he was in hospice care, there was some respite mm -hmm. care tied to hospice. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I I completely completely forgot about the hospice piece. Yes. So, um, but unfortunately, we we're just doing you know general neurology. It's you know just a paid care attendant typically not not covered by insurance. But again, you know connect with the networks and the alliances because they know all of the you know, kind of um, ways to navigate, you know, those those waters and back doors and loopholes and all kinds of good stuff. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, can I add to that? Alex, yes. <laughs> yeah, I just, I wanted to add that um, some people, I feel like it's rare nowadays, have cancer policies or long-term mm -hmm. care insurance, which often will assist with the cost of private duty caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always it's always worth asking about that if, if, if somebody might have it. Absolutely. Can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Ashley, would you, is it possible to get the information personally to me? about this, your sources of getting caregivers without insurance, that's very valuable source. Yeah, I would say, are you in Arizona, sir? Yes. Okay, okay, good. So we're talking the same language then. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, I think my contact information is on the PowerPoint uh, slides you received. And so feel free to reach out to me or anybody at the Ivy Brain uh, Brain. Uh, we, yeah. And I wonder, Sean, are you able to put um, Ashley's slide back up? Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's yep. Ashley's contact information Perfect. right in front of everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah. Feel free to reach out and I'll get you connected with whoever can help navigate you through those waters. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's totally awesome. Um, did anyone else have any information to provide related to, you know, respite care, as well as how to financially pay for it. Just my last suggestion, I don't know if anybody has their hand up, but check out the Foundation for Senior Living and the Area Agency on Aging in your local communities. Um, oftentimes they have like a senior adult independent living program, where again, a lot of these agencies are figuring out that it's a lot cheaper for the state to keep somebody in their home with wraparound services versus paying for them to be institutionalized. So there are these, these caregiver kind of respite resources that are like popping up in pockets, but I would say, you know, Foundation for Senior Living, Area Agency on Aging, I think those are like national resources that most people have in their local communities. Um, mm -hmm. But again, like Alex is like ready and waiting with her headset. So like, feel free to <laughs> feel free to call her she's ready she's she's ready for your call my headset is gone now thank you very much oh I'm sorry my apologies <laughs> I had to switch over but I'm glad you liked it I totally loved it yes absolutely um but yeah so it's just you know reach out keep talking to professionals until you find the information you need and again I will also plug all social workers that are um, also employed by your neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists um, and your oncologists and your neuro neurologists, you know, those that that is something that I believe is part of their job is to help you find that respite care, find the resources to pay for it. It's about being um, really vocal about your needs. You know, I, I literally just personally went through needing some resources for my mom and you know what, we weren't getting them. And so it was, it was pretty easy to really be adamant about setting a meeting with the social worker in the hospital and 
and having that face-to-face and that conversation and the needs. And you know what? We now have what we need for my mom. So it's being voice. I think it's really conversation and talking and getting in front of the everybody, right? About what you need. And I, and I don't know that every oncology outpatient program is going to have a social worker designated to their center. So, which is why the getting connected in the community is so crucial, right? So if they say like, we don't have social workers in outpatient, right? We just have them in inpatient to make sure that you have a safe discharge plan, right? Because that's where I started as a social worker is ordering it, home health and infusion. And I was like, this is not the kind of social worker I want to be. And so here right. I am. <laughs> it's true. I mean, a lot of social workers, you know, that the the ability to have a social worker on staff is actually paid through philanthropy. And I know that our organization paid for a social worker for three years within a um, brain cancer institution, because we realized how, how incredibly important this role was to patients and caregivers and families. So, so just keep asking, um, is all I would say. Okay. We have to move on. 